it's handled. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. So today we're continuing in Micah. Um, I am a big believer in through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter. So that's why whenever I teach, I just go back to what I was last teaching and just keep going through it. Because that's how you should study the Bible. You should get the whole counsel of God. Um, last time we were in Micah, and we've been going through the minor prophets, um, I, I'm a big believer in that every word in the Bible is important. Every dot, every tittle. It all matters. It's all very important. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because there's often this thought that the Old Testament is boring. The Old Testament doesn't, isn't relevant. It doesn't matter. It doesn't apply. That it's just not there for modern times. And that, that thought's been around for a while. And we discussed that last time when we were going through Micah. But I believe, like Paul believed, as he tells us in Timothy, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if you want to do the work of God, you got to know the Old Testament. You got to know every word of the Bible. You got to study it. You got to learn it. And you got to take it to heart. Because every bit of it matters. Not just the New Testament. Not just the stuff with the red letters that Jesus said. Because remember, Jesus is the word. And the word was there from the beginning. So every word in that Bible is a red letter. And we should need to focus on it. And as Christians, we'll often focus on the New Testament. Because, you know, that's where Jesus is. That's where the fun stuff is. That's where all that forgiveness is. That's where the feeding of the homeless, the healing of the miracles, and all that stuff. But all that stuff is in the Old Testament. All that message of forgiveness. All that message of being uh, repentant, of being forgiven, of doing God's will, of being right with your father. It's throughout all of the Old Testament. And it's important that we know that because oftentimes we'll get questions on things that happen in the Old Testament. Oh, what happened to that mean God? What happened to that guy that was punishing everyone? What happened to this? That's not the same God. And there's this, this, this schism that happens right in the middle of, of the Bible between the Old Testament and the New Testament where some people who aren't really as versed in both books can't reconcile the two halves of that God. They see the New Testament as peace and love, and they see the Old Testament as, as just law and punishment. And what we have to remember, because again, the way our God deals with us, there's, you know, in different ways. That was the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Same God. And that's what people forget. It's not that God is this covenant for this God, Old Covenant, Old God. No, it's the same God with these two different covenants, and they all tie together. And as we start to study the Old Testament, we see, because especially as we started with Hosea, and Hosea is the perfect way to start when you're looking at the heart of God. Because Hosea is just this this guy. He's this normal man. He's not a prophet that was raised in the prophet school. He didn't go to the, the religious training of the day. He didn't go to their seminary. He didn't sequester himself for eight years to learn the word. No, he was a farmer. He was a sheep breeder, literally a person who bred sheep. And he was called out to minister to God's people. Why? Why? Because Israel was an adulterous nation. And Hosea was told to go marry a harlot so that he would live the life that God is living every day with us. The life where He did everything for the believer. And the believer constantly stumbles and falls short. Where the believer constantly walks away from God. Where Israel, his bride, his virgin bride, will constantly go into idolatry, constantly cheat on him, constantly seek other attention from other gods. And it's phrased in Hosea like a marital relationship because it's between him and Gomer. Hosea is told to marry this prostitute. This prostitute who not only will prostitute herself throughout the marriage, but will also bear him children who aren't even his. In an analogy of how Israel is bringing up Jewish people who weren't worshiping their God. They weren't God's children. They were bastards. They were children that Israel had had away from God. And that was the relationship with Gomer and Hosea. Now, this was all around the mid-700s. And again, after Hosea, we went through Joel. And his prophecies are very short. But he tells about these locusts that are coming. These locusts that are coming in judgment. These locusts that Israel is going to face. In this time period, Israel is split into two separate kingdoms. 
And all these prophets, these minor prophets, are being sent to Israel one after another. And in Joel, we're told that it is these locusts that are coming. These locusts that are coming. This judgment that is coming. Now, we learned in Joel when we were going through it that that was Hazel of Damascus who would come through. And in around Amos' time, where they talk about the desolation and the poverty and the famine in the land, how they can't afford to even pay the temple tax. You saw the fulfillment of those locusts coming in, um, previously had been fulfilled by Hazel and Damascus. And again, this is all around the 700 series. And in Amos, God is pretty clear about what he wants. Seek me and live. That's it. The only thing he's asking of the Jewish people throughout all these prophets. Seek after me. Not this idolatry, not these other things you keep going through. And through all of this, he's telling these things are coming. These things are coming. And it's because of your greed. It's because of what you've done. It's because, and he goes through everything. And he says, hear this who tramples the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over and that we may sell the grain? So greedy for profit that they stopped looking at the poor. So we start to see this, this picture of Israel at this time. You start to see an Israel that is wanting in God's eyes. So much so that Israel is so negligent to their duties to their God that their politicians are corrupt. They seek after profit for their own gain. The people who run their businesses in their land look at the poor in the land like they are only for profit. That the only way the people exist is so that they can have profit. This is what's going on in Israel at this time. The foreign powers, the, the leaders in the Israel at this time are relying on foreign powers to prop themselves up. The trade is going throughout the land. They're buying chariots from Assyria, their enemies. They're giving food and money to their enemies to prop up their own defense. They're relying on other people outside of God to secure their borders. They're relying on their own might to prop themselves up as an empire. And this time period we talked about in Israel's history, the 6700 period AD, I mean BC that's coming upon them, all these things is, are actually profitable times for Israel. It's a major nation. They have free trade with the world. They're gaining armies, they're gaining might. Their people are profitable, their people have money. The, the, they're, they're, they're able to spend on things they like. And what's happening is all these foreign influences are coming in from all around. They're starting to worship the Molochs. They're starting to burn their children at these altars. They're starting to do all these wicked, evil things, you know, these things like abortion in their land. Because when you're burning your child, I don't care if it's after it's born or before it's born, you're murdering someone. And that's what they're doing in their land. They are going after these foreign gods. So their politicians are corrupt. The businessmen are ignoring the people's need and are only taking them for profit. The people themselves are so strapped that they're ignoring their duty to the poor. They're forgetting the homeless in the streets. They're forgetting these things that are happening. They're letting the political corruption, all these foreign influences coming in and out of the nation of Israel every day, influence their morality. They start to do things like burn their children. They start to do things like sexual immorality in the worship of these gods. No longer is marriage sacred. No longer is your children sacred. No longer do the poor need help. And throughout all these Old Testament minor, uh, minor prophets that God is sending one after another, we hear the same message start coming about in Israel at this time. That something is wrong. Something is very wrong in Israel. And then at this point we get to Obadiah. And we think, well, God only cares about his children, obviously, because he's only focusing on them in this time period in the Old Testament. God only cares about what's his. No, in Obadiah, we see another prophet set around the same time to Edom, which is not Israeli. They are a relative, but they're, they're not Jews. And in there, he tells them the same warnings. You guys are messing up. The judgment is coming. These bad things are happening because of your behavior and things need to change. And so that's, that's okay. That's a cousin of the Jews. And you see this heart of God as we're going through this path through the Old Testament prophets, these minor prophets. Then you get to Jonah, a very weird prophet, because again, Jonah is sent not to anyone related to the Jews. He is sent directly to their enemy. It would be like if, I don't know, who's an enemy we have now? Pick one. North Korea. If a prophet, of, if someone in America just went to North Korea to talk to their leader. Because the prophets of God do what's necessary no matter what. 
They go wherever God tells them to go. And that's what every one of these prophets so far have done. They went where God told them to do and said the message God told them to do. And Jonah was rightfully terrified. We all know Jonah's story because he's the most famous of these guys. He ran for the hills. But here's the thing. Through all of this, God's message was always clear. Even to the Gentile nations who weren't his. Repent. And in Jonah, we saw miracles happen. We saw the sign of Jonah, which I may have told you guys, looks very similar to what Jesus did. Dead three days, rises, Gentile nation saved. And that's what Jonah did. And so then we got to Micah. We're going back to the Jewish people. And by this point, we should know there is something dangerous coming upon Israel. There is danger on the horizon, and God is constantly warning them. And this is a good message for any Christian when you're reading through the Old Testament and the Old Prophets. How many times did you hear the gospel message before you accepted it? How many times did someone come to you with the truth before you truly accepted it? And suddenly, you start to see, why is God sending all these prophets to Israel at the same time? Why are these, why are these 12 minor prophets being hammered on Israel constantly, constantly, constantly with the same message? Repent. Because it's the same message. It's always been the same message. It's the good news. Forgiveness can be had at the hands of the Lord if you just repent. And with that, we're going to go through Micah briefly, what we covered. In Micah 1, it opened up to tell us that um, the word of the Lord came to Micah of Morsheth. We learned that Morsheth Gath was a, something that, a city that uh, Israel had claimed from Gath during that whole thing. You remember Gath, David, Goliath. Goliath was from Gath, giants. And it says, Hear you people, all you people, listen carefully, and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. And we talked about how that would be an amazing thing to hear if you were right with the Lord. When we hear that trumpet blow, it's exciting. Because we're right with him. But if you're not, that trumpet blowing to Israel, as we talked about in here, because after Micah 1, it starts to go through the list of crimes that Israel had so far committed in Micah 1. And that's what we covered last time. And it was telling them that this is all for the transgressions of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. So the corruption started at the top. Whenever your nation is, when the nation's corrupt, you could usually look at the leaders of the government and say, that's where it started. When the people down on the streets are immoral, they don't do what they're supposed to. When, you know, Children are aborting their children that they've had out of wedlock. You know, young, young girls are doing that. You can look at that and go, oh, they are horrible children. But I guarantee one thing. You look back in that nation's history who did that, and you see where that started. You'll see where the responsibility was the day they decided we are going to take God out of our government. And that's when those corruptions started. And that's what God was telling through Micah. Because we've got to remember, these, these Old Testament prophets are coming out onto the scene like a prosecutor. They are like, you have been arrested and they want you going to court. And God is your judge. That's what every one of these minor prophets are doing. And, he, and he, Micah starts to, to tell this stuff, like, your leaders are corrupt. But here's the thing. What every prophet knows, and what every pastor knows, they are not separate from the flock. And in Micah, we see that. Because in Micah 8, he hears these horrible things. Michael uh, 1.8. He hears these horrible things coming against Israel. And this is what he does. Therefore, I will wail in hell. I will go strip naked. And I will make a wailing like the jackals. And a mourning like the ostrich. For her wounds are incurable. For it has come to Judah. It has come to the gate of my people. To Jerusalem. And see, so Micah has been told. These judgments are coming against Israel. You're, and so he's not like, I'm a prophet. I'm good. God talks to me. I'm okay. I have my pass. I got on the ark. Door closed. I'm safe. I'm with Noah. Or I, I'm covered in the blood of Christ. I'm good. I'm saved. Lord, come quickly. Come soon. Get me out of this wicked world. Because I am separate from this wicked world. That's not what Micah did. Micah's righteous, and the righteous heart says this, Oh my God, they are not, and they are going to suffer. They are going to die without God. They are going to torment and suffer in hell forever. 
And Micah does what any good prophet or pastor does when he sees people lost and hurting. He mourns, he wails in his heart, he rends his clothing because he knows. He's saved. He knows the glory of God. But Micah knows that his brothers don't. And Micah knows his message is to spread that no matter what. Because every prophet we've seen so far as we go through these minor prophets ends up being looking like a fool. They end up looking stupid to the people they are preaching against. And suddenly these minor prophets start to seem more and more relevant to our world. Go speak out against abortion. Right now. Go pick a place publicly. Any place. Go talk about abortion. How about gay marriage? Who's brave enough to go into any place in Portland and say, please stop. You're going to hell. You're going to die. Who's brave enough to do that? It's hard. These prophets don't stop. These prophets face it because they're going up against wicked people who don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They know not what to do. And that's what every prophet that God called to do, every person that God gives that message to, that's what they're told to do. Take the hit on the cheek. Spread this message to a people who don't want to hear it. And that's what we see in Micah when he's crying for it. And he goes on in three. Why is this all happening in three? And again, just reviewing what we're going through. And it's always the same. It starts up here. In three, he tells it's the leaders. It's the rulers. It's the prophets. Because the people have prophets who won't say what I just said. Because they're listening to people who won't say abortion is murder. That you cannot kill a baby and not face the wrath of God at some point. That wrath has to be either paid for by Jesus Christ or you're going to face it yourself. How many women, young women, had abortions who weren't saved and went about their life thinking that this world told them it was okay and then on the day of their judgment, they're going to have to explain why they murdered a baby. And no Christian came alongside them and said, hey, did you know that was a sin? But there is forgiveness to be had. Because their prophets in Israel weren't doing that. It was more popular to worship Moloch, to burn your baby in a fire, than not to. Because that's where Israel had fallen to at their point in their degradation. They had gone so far that the people in Israel weren't willing to say, you can't kill a baby. Because they were worshiping the Moloch. And as we go through these, you suddenly start to see how relevant and important these minor Old Testament prophets are to our time. That suddenly our time starts to sound very similar to Israel's times where the leaders were looking to foreign powers. They were corrupt and profiting, putting money into their own pocket when they were supposed to be helping Israel. When they were supposed to be building the nations, building the nation's defenses, they were aligning their wealth. When they were supposed to be helping the poor, helping the people who couldn't feed themselves, they were lining their pockets. When the priests and the pastors and the prophets were supposed to be telling people, your sin is sin, look to the Lord. There is judgment coming if you do not. What did they do? Keep doing what you're doing, people. There's no sin. Everything is okay. Do what's right in your own eyes. Worship the Molochs, kill your babies, do whatever you want. Go to those uh, temples where they have prostitutes and have sex out of marriage, that's fine. Every woman in the nation of Israel who would worship one of these gods, the Baals, would have to prostitute herself at one point in her life. And we had learned that other times in the Minor Prophets. So Israel is facing a very dire time. It is bad. They have seen one after another of the warnings of God coming to them. We know a time is coming to Israel where this exile is coming. The people they had given bought chariots from would come and take their land. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, they would come through. And God is telling Micah, he has to go through and tell them all this. And that's what he's doing. He's going through all of this. And in four, he's telling them it's going to be horrible. It's going to be bad. Your rulers, everything's going to be knocked down. It's a powerful judgment against the, what's going on in Israel at this time. And that's the summary. Now we're going to open up in Micah 5. But before we do that, there's one thing that we have to remember. And Micah 4 ended with a promise. There's a promise to come. A promise in the end of Micah 4 of the regathering of Israel. And Micah 5, after discussing 
all these horrible things that would befall Israel after leveling claim, one thing after another of what the sin you have done. Imagine you're being prosecuted and Israel has just been told by Michael, these are all the things you did wrong. You did this. You did that. You did this. And they did. They absolutely did all these horrible things. But he opens up in five. O oh, daughter of troops, he has laid seas against you. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Now, this is uh, verse one right away. That's a sign of what's coming. But it's also talking about the coming Messiah. So we know about the coming Messiah. So when it says that the troops have surrounded them and have laid seeds against them, we know that it's the Roman Empire at this time. So in the middle of all these dire prophecies of Israel, these, you're going to go into slavery. You're going to go into Babylon. You're going to do this. But wait. Something's going to come. A promise that God had given Israel. Not because of who they were, but because of who he is. But you, Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet you, out of you, shall come forth to me, the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from the old, from everlasting. So could you imagine this? You are being told, your sin is so black. You have done so wrong but I'm going to help you. That's what God is saying right there in that verse. There is a Messiah coming. There is a promise from everlasting to everlasting. The end of days is coming and he is going to make all this corruption right. Because that's the one thing we have to remember with God. When people say, oh, look at the Old Testament. Look at all that bully God who wants you to follow the law. Every time he does that, every time he tells Israel you have sinned, every time he says punishment is coming, he does the opposite. But there's a promise. Jesus is coming. There's always that promise. And with that promise of destruction, of the sin that Israel had fallen into, Jesus will come and he will save. And that's what he's telling them. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. So he's telling them at this time, Israel is going to be regathered. There's Messiah is going to come. And we have to remember, whenever there's a messianic prophecy anywhere in the Bible, it always has to jump. Because we know as Christians that there is the coming, there is the death and resurrection, the going away, and then the coming back for his rightful reign. This is all in one. And it tells them, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the, uh, the Lord his God and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth and this one shall be peace. So a very strange thing right in the middle of it. And it says that, and when he treads in our places, then we will rise against him. Seven shepherds, eight princely men, they shall waste uh, the sword of the land of Assyria and they have the land of Nimrod at their entrances. Thus shall deliver us from the Assyrians when comes into our land, and when he treads within our borders. And see, this is part of the confusion the Israelis had when Jesus showed up. Was they had all these, okay, they, they missed, they got that, okay, yeah, they'll strike his rod with the cheek, whatever that means. They didn't get that part. They got the conquering part. They're like, yeah, he's going to come and conquer. And you see where they missed that. Because it started off with, they're going to strike his rod with the cheek. And they're like, oh, what's that's nothing. That's just, what's that going to be? We know that's the suffering Messiah. He's going to suffer. So the Jews miss that in this part of the prophecy about him. Because it says, when he's in our land, these things are going to happen. And it says, like, the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people, like dews from the Lord, like showers on the grass, that tarry for no man. The Jews would be scattered throughout the world. They would be dropped throughout every nation in little bits sprinkled across the world. How crazy is that? That this prophecy from how many years ago? From the 700 BCs is, was fulfilled or is still being fulfilled. That tarry for no man nor wait for the sons of men and the remnant of Jacob's shall be among the Gentiles. I don't know about you, but whenever the Bible directly says something that actually happened in world history, I just get a little chill. 
because the Jews were among the Gentiles. They were scattered to the winds. In the midst of many people, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flock of the sheep, who if he passes through, both treads down and tears in pieces, and none can, de- can deliver, your hand shall be lifted against your adversaries, and your enemy shall be cut off. So it's talking about the time that I believe we're in now, the reforming of Israel, where this prophecy where they were telling them after this Babylonian exile that Jesus, all this stuff was going to happen to them, that they were going to get a Messiah at some point, and at some point, Israel would be regathered from all the lands that they were scattered to. So keep in mind, this is God punishing them. But in that punishment, he's giving them the most dear promise that we all have. And that at one point in the future, God's going to make everything right. And that's a message I think we all need to get. As long as we are working here in the flesh, this is never going to work. It'll never work. This is, there will always be problems. No government, no pastor, no group, no organization, no ruler, no, no army, no force on this earth is ever going to bring this peace that they're talking about here. It's never going to happen. None of this stuff is going to happen until the Lord comes and returns because he's promising Israel a peaceful day where they no longer have to fight. And it says in 10, And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. I will cut off uh, sorceries from your hand and you shall have no soothsayers. Your carved images I will also cut off and your sacred pillars from your midst. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I will pluck you from your wooden images from your midst. Thus I will destroy your cities and I will uh, execute vengeance and anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. So he's telling them what's going to happen in that day. In that day there will be peace. In that day the rule of the Lord will be listened to. Because there will be no more idolatry. People will no longer work and uh, no longer worship the work of their hands. And that's an idea that I think a lot of people get confused because your work of your hands, they're talking about idolatry. In idolatry, we think Moloch. Interesting thing to note, I just read an article that the Catholic Church allowed a statue of Moloch to be put at the Colosseum. Might want to look that up later. It's kind of weird. Um, people think that when they think idolatry. It's Moloch. It's a demon. I'm going to carve an idol. I'm going to put a demon. That's a bad thing. We forget our house can be an idol. Our cars can be an idol. Our clothing can be an idol. The work of our hand. Anything we trust more than we trust the Lord, that's the work of your hand. Anytime I go, hey God, I got this one. You could take a step back. I can handle this one on my own. I am instantly putting the work of my hand before the Lord. And like Marcia said earlier, sometimes the best prayer is, Lord, help me. That's it. Because when I say, Lord, help me, guess what? I'm no longer worshiping the work of my hand. I'm no longer saying, Lord, I got this. Step back, God. I can handle this. I'm saying, Lord, I can't. Every morning I get up, Lord, help me today. Because you know why? I can't do this. I mess up. I will screw up something. I mean, either I'll get up late, something will go wrong, I'll say the wrong thing, I'll be mean to someone I shouldn't have. But if I rely on the Lord, I'm not relying on the work of my hands. I'm saying, Lord, you have to do this because I can't. And it's very easy when you're successful. Because Israel, it's really easy to take a look at Israel and go, oh, that's just them. They're crazy. But if you look at Israel, you turn them into a person. And I say, he was saved. God loved him, provided for him. And then he started looking around and saw the grass was greener in other places. He started getting real secure in his position God had put him in. And then he started looking at the, the cars his neighbors were driving. And he started working, well, maybe I can work out a way to get that my own way. And he starts doing things on his own. And at some point, Israel wanders away and, he, and he's sacrificing babies on the altar to Moloch. And it's just because it's a little leaven leavens the whole bunch. A little bit of compromise. A little bit of letting the world in will destroy your walk with Christ. And this is what happened to Israel over and over. And thankfully what we see is he doesn't just give us one warning. We see minor prophet after minor prophet beating on their Israel's head like, hey, stop it. Why do you keep doing this? And so he's promising them that this is the heart of God in this, in this minor prophet. Because the heart of God is, remember, is the prodigal father pacing the porch. He's not sitting there with the bat for where the belt when his son gets home is going to whoop him. He's, the prodigal father wasn't pacing like, oh, when that boy gets home, I'm going to whoop him. 
No, it was, he's, he's not safe right now. He's away from me. He's in the world suffering. Why would he do that? And as we go on to the, um, man, here, you'll start to see God's attitude toward it. Because it's telling him all these promises on what's going to happen. He's telling him, look, and the people that hurt you, the nations that hurt you will suffer. The ones that didn't listen to me, because you're going to listen to me at some point. He knows that. They will have vengeance for what they've done to you. And you see that God, he's, he's going through this. And again, if you think of it like a prosecutor, he's giving him this case. He's telling him, this is what you did. This is, what I'm, this is what's going to happen. This is, this is what's going to happen after once everything's done. And then he goes on in six. And six is probably, six is just as we read through it, I think it's, it's pretty heartbreaking a little bit. Because this is again, hear now what the Lord says. Arise. Plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, ho, you mountains, the Lord's complaints. And you strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a complaint against his people and he will contend with Israel. He's crying out to creation against Israel. Like, look, look, the mountains, look at, look at this. Look at what they're doing. It's like he, he's like going to the other things he created. Look at this. Look how awful this is. Because he can't even, he's told Israel, they're not listening and he's going on, oh my people, what have I done to you? And right there you see the heart of it. Because if you remember back in Hosea, who, if anyone has had children's, children, has anyone had a marriage or a girlfriend or boyfriend where something went astray, where they left or your child went into drugs and alcohol or something went wrong in that relationship. And every one of us have had that moment where, what did I do? What wrong did I do? Like in Hosea, was I, did I not provide enough? Did I not give you a good home? Did I not treat you with the love and respect you deserve? To Gomer, the prostitute wife who ran off? And in this verse, you see, oh my people, this is God speaking to Israel. What have I done? And how have I uh, wearied you? He's, he's almost like, what, what did I do? What did, did, did you get bored of me? Was I not good enough? Did I not provide enough? And it's his father hurt. He's hurt. And he's telling Israel, like, this punishment is coming no matter what. And this father is, is telling him, like, have I worried you? He goes, testify against me. Let me know. What bad did I do? When did, when did I hurt you? What, when was it? Let me know. God is telling them, pleading with them. Why are you so evil? What are you doing? How did I hurt you and make you do that? What did I do? This is God pleading with his people. It is a brokenhearted father is telling him, did, did I forget to give you something? Was there something better you wanted that I did not provide? And yet you still did this. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I set before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. And if you remember that, he was trying to get the pro one of the, the soothsayers to curse Israel. And he went and tried, and God, God, he was like, no, I can't get God to curse Israel. He's reminding them, like, I, you couldn't, they couldn't even pay people to get me to curse you. What did I do wrong is what he keeps saying. And he goes, and, he goes, um, and what Balaam and the son of Bear answered him from Asiya Grove to Gilgag, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Don't you remember the desert? Don't you remember the manna from heaven? Don't you remember the water from the rock? Don't you remember the plagues of Egypt? Don't you remember the strong hand of the Pharaoh that was keeping you in bondage and my mightier hand that delivered you from it? What did I do wrong in all that? And see, every time we wander from our Christian walk, didn't I save you from drugs and alcohol? Didn't I stop you from gambling? Didn't I stop you from whatever perversion you were in? Didn't, didn't God save you from that? And every time we wander from it, he's that father that's hurt. Like, didn't I save you from all that? Why are you going back to it? Didn't I save you from drinking? Why are you having a drink? Didn't I save you from gambling? Why are you buying that lotto ticket? Didn't I save you from those things? Isn't your life better now? And every time we wander away from it, that's God's heart breaking. Because it's the heart of a father that wants his child to do well. This, this God of the Old Testament that punish, punish, punish. We were all kids. We remember when our parents punished us. And we have to look at God maturely. 
and understand that not with a child's heart being punished by God, that when God punishes us, it's because he truly is the best father we could ever have. And when the best father punishes us, like he's going to punish Israel, you know it's for their better. You know it's because he loves them. And in this, he's tell, it's, it's almost like he's just explaining it to them. Like, look guys, this really bad thing's going to happen because of how you behaved. But I'm going to get you through it. And I really want you to know, like, look, look, remember all these things that I did for you. You're going to get through it. But it's going to be bad. It's like a parent punishing his kid for doing really bad. It hurts the parent. And that's what's happening in this, in, in all of these minor prophets. These, yeah, Israel is going to go through a lot. But God hurts every time. Every time he's hurting through all of this. And he's telling them, testify against me. If there's something I did wrong, let me know. Why did you stray? Why did you sacrifice your babies to the Moloch? What did I do wrong that you looked to Assyria for your help and not me? That you looked to Moloch, a demon, instead of me? What did I do? Tell me what I did wrong. And then it just switches a little bit. Because it's, it's Micah telling God, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come with him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Like, what can I do to correct this? God's coming against us. What do I do to fix this? Our land is corrupt. And he's like, is a calf going to be enough? Is sacrifice going to be enough? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousands rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? Isn't that funny? Should a human man give his firstborn for his transgression? Micah say no. That wouldn't be enough. And how funny that was hidden from Micah because in that one sentence, God's going to provide the firstborn that would be enough. Because Micah's firstborn could never be enough. None of our firstborn could ever be enough. And in that one sentence right there, we see, he says, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Isn't that funny? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? So he's telling them, I'll do anything. Oh, well, you want lambs? You want rivers of oil? My firstborn child. That's what I'll give you. And as with all of us, that's the works of your flesh, kind of, isn't it? He's trying to give them everything I have. What do I have, Lord? What can I give you? All he wants, do justly. Treat people fairly. Not all your money. God doesn't want all your money. He doesn't want all your tithes. He doesn't want everything you own. He doesn't want all your hours in a day. He doesn't want any of that. He doesn't want your effort. He doesn't want it. Do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. It's the golden rule. Do justly. Treat people right. Care for the poor. Don't take advantage of people. Don't do all the things you've done, Israel. So the only payment God ever required, love him. Do what he says. That's it. Just walk humbly with the Lord. And it goes on in 9. Hear the rod who has appointed it. Are there yet treasures of the wicked in the house of the wicked? And the short measure that is an abomination. Shall I count pure things with the wicked scales and those with a bag of deceitful weights? For her rich men are full of violence, her inhabitants have spoken lies, and their tongues is deceitful in their mouths. Nothing Israel has has not been corrupted. There is not a dollar in Israel that is not covered in blood. There is nothing they have left. It has been so corrupt. When it says that their scales are, um, are wicked, when the scales are off, that's when you go get, you know, you go get four quarters for a dollar and they give you three. Because that's just what it is. And that's what they were doing. So they were making profit of everyone. And everything is so corrupt that there is was, there was almost no going back at this point. Therefore, I will also make you sick by striking you, by making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat but not be satisfied. Hunger shall be in your midst. You may carry some away but shall not save them. And what do you rescue? I will give over to the sword. So he's telling them, all those riches, not going to be enough. And that's one thing that God is frequent to do. When we want our sin, when we revel in our sin, he'll let us have it. And then it won't fulfill you. 
and you'll seek more and you'll seek more and it'll never be enough. There will always be an empty pit. In America, some of our richest people pay zero taxes. Their rightful tax amount would probably be enough to pay all of our salaries for a few years easily. Like Jeff Bezos of Amazon, richest man in the world, pays no taxes because it's not enough. It's never enough. The rich will always be greedy. They will always give over to their greed. Wealth leads to that, leads to that. And he's telling them like, this is why it's gonna get taken away. You don't care anymore. You, people don't care for people anymore. And he says, you're going to be put to the sword. He says, you shall sow but not reap. So in other words, you're gonna work and not see any benefit for your labor. You shall tread the olives, but not anoint yourself with the oil. So you're going to make products, but you're not going to drink them. You're not going to enjoy them. You're going to be the slaves for other people again. You will make sweet wine, but not drink the wine. For the statue of Ormar are kept. All the works of Ahab's house are done, and you walk in their councils. So you're looking to the foreigners, the lands that you weren't supposed to. And that's where your hope is. And it's going to leave you desolate. That I will make you a desolation and your inhabitants a hissing. Therefore, you shall bear the reproach of my people. And it says, Woe to me, for I am those who gather summer fruits, like those who give, glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat. Are the first ripe fruit with my soul desires. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. That they may, lie, uh, may successfully do evil with both their hands. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seek a bribe. And the great man utters his evil desires. So they scheme together, the best of them like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Uh, it is so wicked in Israel that everyone... Is it has their hands out for a bribe. If you need help, first. What are you going to pay me with? You know, like if you need to get a house addition built, you need to go pay the city for some permits or something like that. It's, everyone wants a little bit of what anyone else has. It's just so corrupt. It says, do not trust in a friend. Do not your, put your confidence in a companion. So even Israel has gotten so bad that it's, it's just, even your best friend can't be trusted. Guard the doors of your mouth from um, her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own household. See, I read that and that got me a little th thinking because recently I dealt with something in my family and inheritance is awful. And a family member directly tried to get another family member's inheritance. And some of you may have heard of it. Dana had to go down and deal with it. It's a wicked time in, that we live in and to see parallels of in Israel in the same, gripped in the same things. And there's only one thing I gotta say. All these things are happening. You see all these parallels between now and then, just in general. And you guys forget one thing. This is a warning of judgment for how wicked Israel is. And I have to stop and think, well, what time is it here? When how wicked is America? When all these things go on? Like, nothing in this book looks foreign to me if I look out there. Nothing in these Old Testament minor prophets as I'm reading through it, when I look outside at downtown Portland, they look awfully similar. So you have to begin to wonder what's going to happen here. And he says, like, he's saying, look, all this bad stuff is going to happen. But he tells you what you do when times are like that. Because he tells you next, what do you do when all this world is wicked, when you can't trust your best friend, when you can't trust anyone, when your family tries to steal from you, when the whole world is corrupt? Therefore, I will look to the Lord and I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So he's not, he, yes, it's, it's awful. Yes, it's bad. But guess what? When it gets like that, don't worry about that. Keep to the message. Keep doing what Micah's doing. He's telling him against it because you know what he's going to do? When it gets bad, he's going to look to his God because he knows where his salvation comes from. And that's what he's saying. He says, do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. Because, why? Because he says, I will rise. Because he knows Israel's going to fall. But he's going to rise because God is with him. 
when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light unto me. So again, Michael knows it's going to be dark. It's going to be bad. I have to go through this. But the Lord's going to be my light. I don't need the light of the world. No matter how dark this seems right now, no matter how bad the world is at this very moment, no matter what danger we are placed in, no matter what lacking we have, no matter what bills that need to get paid, no matter how much desperate we may see our life is in that moment, Micah knows what we all should know. I'm going to look to the Lord because that's where my salvation is. And no matter how dark it looks out here, he's my light. He's going to be what I follow. And that's what he's saying. He's just, the Lord's going to be my, my light. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm bad. I know I'm an evil man. But I know my Lord will deliver me. So I will endure whatever punishment I need to take on this earth until the Lord saves me. He will bring me forth to the light. I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover who who said to me, where, the, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. So he's saying like, oh yeah, you're, oh, you're good. those people who said, oh, your God's going to save you. You're a Christian. All right, yeah, all right. What, where's your God? He knows. Oh, he'll be there. And one day they will see him. And that's the thing in Micah is, is he, throughout all these dire predictions, these dire proclamations, he knows who his hope is, where his hope relies on, where no matter how evil the city looks around you, no matter how wicked your neighbors look, he knows where he's going to look. And he says in 11, in that day when your walls are to be built, in that day the decree shall go forth far and wide, in that day they shall come to you from Assyria and the fortified cities, from the fortresses to the river, from sea to sea, and mountain to mountain. Yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, who dwell solitary in the woodlands in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, and I will show them wonders. This is talking about this time that I believe we are now actively in the reformation of Israel. It's regathering. We are seeing a time where most of these prophets would have killed to see. Micah through Hosea so far. They would all have died to see this moment in Israel's history. Because remember, they heard what was coming. They heard the destruction. They heard the, the lack of self-rule. Because one thing people forget is, that, yes, they do get back into Israel with Rome. You know, but they're not self-ruled. They never get self-ruled again. They did not get self-ruled again until after World War II. So all these prophecies that are right here, he's telling them, this is going to happen. We are living in it. And we happen to live in a time that mirrors a lot of these weird things that happen in the Old Testament. And we should be aware. We should know them. We should always look to them. Because it says, The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall uh, fear because of you. So what's going to happen in Israel is going to make every nation in the world afraid. Sounds kind of familiar, right? How often do we hear Israel in the news? How often do we hear all this little tiny nation, little tiny Israel, is constantly causing all the nations around them an uproar? And he's telling them this is what's going to happen. And why? Because they're going to fear the Lord. When the world starts to see the Lord work and move, they fear him. They fear us. Because we remind them of that sin. Who is God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and he will subdue, subdue our iniquities. You will cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Where does that mean God? Where is that punishing lawful God who, who is the, you know, like that, that, was it, like that nun with the ruler who wants to smack everybody? I don't see that God when I read the Old Testament. And I really hope you guys don't either. 
Because every page of the Old Testament, when you see that God with that ruler about to smack, that's what the people remember. That's what the sinners remember. You know, that, remember that guilty conscience when you had that guilt over your head all the time? You know when your kid does something and you go like, did you do something? Like, no, I didn't do nothing. You know that? You remember that when you are children? Whenever you see, hear someone say that the God of the Old Testament is a mean bully, I want you to remember that child. Because that child didn't get forgiveness. Because to the child who got forgiveness when his father was mad at him, we remember that no, he was just upset that we hurt ourselves. And he didn't want us to do it again. And so we know, we see the Old Testament God and we see love. We see his love. We see his mercy. Who is like you, God, who pardons iniquity and passes it over to the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? We have the only God who forgives because he forgives. He wants to forgive us. It's not because it's something we did. God isn't sitting there just waiting, okay, let's see what they're going to do to earn my forgiveness. Come on, what's your, best, what's your best present? Come on, right now. That's not him. He's sitting there eagerly going, please, just come back to me. I'll forgive you. Just, just come here. You just have to show up. Just call me, talk to me, and you will have instant forgiveness. Your heritage is yours. Everything's yours. We have that only God. There is none like him. And that's why we're, we're ending. As we end in Micah, I want to end on that point. Because Micah's name means who is like him? Who is like God? What God is like that? What God would send prophet after prophet after prophet to a nation that murders its babies? What God would send preacher after preacher after preacher to a nation that goes into a prostitu- prostitution? What God would send person after person after person to spread the good news to a nation that doesn't even believe in him? Our God would. And that's why we have to be prepared always to deliver the good news in season and out of season. Always be prepared to give an answer to the hope that is in you. And I'm going to use Jim as an example. If I dangle Jim upside down by his feet, I guarantee at least 10 to 15 Bible tracts will fall off him. At least one or two copies of the book of John. A couple stickers. And a bunch of Bible tracts as well. Just various other things. You know why? Because blessed are the feet that could bring the good news. And every one of us is called to be that person. It may not be like Micah. You not, may not be called to drop, walk over to Washington, D.C. and start shouting, repent, the end is near. But I guarantee you have a neighbor or a friend or a coworker or a brother or sister, nephew, niece, uncle, aunt, great aunt, great grandmother, someone who never truly heard that message. And that message is simple. Repent and he'll forgive. Believe in Jesus and you can have forgiveness. You don't have to be guilty. You don't have to pay punishment alone. You have a God who loves you and is constantly sending people to give you this message. And that's where we'll end in Micah.